With today's lecture, we begin to treat the four dialogue sequence devoted to presenting the trial, execution, conviction, and execution of Socrates. It's arguable, I suppose, that, that all the dialogues of Plato allude in, in one way or another to the tension between the philosopher and his political community, between the life lived in the, the light of the sun and the life lived in the, the semi-darkness of the cave, between the truth and conventional opinion. But Plato made this tension his focus in these four dialogues especially. First, there's the Euthyphro. It's set on the steps of the courthouse that Socrates is about to enter in order to attend to a sort of preliminary hearing prior to his trial. Second is the Apology of Socrates, which records part of the trial itself. Third is the, the Crito, set in Socrates' prison cell after he has been condemned to die. And then finally, the Phaedo, which records the very day on which Socrates was compelled to drink hemlock and thus die. Now today we're going to consider the first part of these, the Euthyphro. The question it takes up is this, what is piety? What, in other words, is devotion to and, and worship of the gods, one of the traditional virtues? Now the theoretical importance of this question I think it probably isn't so hard to see. We remember here uh, Aristophanes' challenge to Socrates. Can you really claim to know, Socrates, all that you claim to know or must know, in order to live as you do? Namely, that the gods of the Greek myths don't exist, and that the world is governed not by the will of Zeus and the other Olympians, but by impersonal nature. The question, what is piety? is then a very loaded one. It's a question freighted with theoretical or, or philosophic importance. But that question is also of great moral, political significance. Let's remember that Socrates here was indicted on a twofold charge, of not believing in the gods in whom the city believed, and of corrupting the young. Now, as I've already said, the former charge is really the more fundamental one as Socrates himself suggests in the Apology. It's the corruption, the corruption in question, consists of his allegedly unorthodox religious opinions. If the Oikonomicus is Xenophon's somewhat uh, comic or, or muted presentation of Socrates' confrontation with ordinary moral religious opinion in the person of Iskomachos, then the Euthyphro, I think, would most obviously be Plato's comparable presentation of that confrontation. And the Euthyphro, too, has its comic elements. Despite the, the gravity of the circumstances in which the conversation takes place, and, and uh, uh, despite the gravity of the central question, what is piety? Not to put too fine a point on it, Euthyphro, the character, is a bit of a nut. And Plato's uh, most direct presentation of the most sensitive question takes place with somebody who wasn't taken all that seriously by the Athenians themselves. This fact, I think, affords Socrates some measure of protection. If he's seen disagreeing with or, or maybe even angering Euthyphro, well, Euthyphro is Euthyphro. He isn't quite a representative of, of respectable opinion or, or of religious orthodoxy. Now, what I propose today to, to do today is simply give an account of the most important features of, of Socrates' dialogue with Euthyphro. And I want to pay particular attention to the action as well as the arguments. And always keep in mind both the theoretical and the moral significance of its central question. I'll turn first to discuss the dialogue's most prominent features, especially the circumstances that surround it. Second, I'll take up in turn each of the main arguments concerning piety. And then third and finally, I'll, I'll offer a kind of summary of the whole dialogue and make some more general remarks about its importance. Well, first things first then. We see immediately that the dialogue, Euthyphro, is performed rather than narrated, and that the title is not at all surprising. Socrates' only interlocutor here is Euthyphro. And while the conversation unfolds in a, in a public place, the, the portico, as it's called, of the courthouse, there isn't any indication that anybody else is present or is overhearing their remarks.
So to that extent, the conversation between the two men is a private one. Now, the circumstances of the conversation require a bit of explanation. Socrates, as I've said, is, is on his way into the courthouse to attend what we would probably call a, a preliminary hearing uh, pertaining to his pending trial. Euthyphro is either on his way into the courthouse or is just coming from it. That remains unclear. But so far from being the victim of a prosecution himself, Euthyphro is bringing a charge against somebody, a charge of murder. And not against just anybody, but against his very own father. Now this fact, maybe it seems strange to us. To an ancient Greek, for whom one's parents deserved unquestioned respect, such a charge is, charge is unthinkable. It's monstrous. That Euthyphro himself tells Socrates, Socrates that his family is up in arms over what he's doing. Here's what happened. One of the family's hired laborers got drunk and, in a rage, killed one of the family servants. So Euthyphro's father bound the drunken murderer, put him in a ditch, and immediately sent for one of the religious authorities, called an exegete, to determine what he ought to do. But during the time that they waited for the exegete to arrive, the bound man died. And so now Euthyphro, on behalf of the deceased murderer, is bringing a charge of murder against his own father. Now, for my part, I'd say that Euthyphro's action is not obviously right or, or praiseworthy. Not only is he proceeding against his own father to avenge the death of a stranger, but his father, I think, unintentionally killed someone who had clearly murdered. And his father had called upon the correct religious authorities to tell him how to proceed. If the man died, it was not, apparently, through any malicious act on the part of, of Euthyphro's father. But Euthyphro will have none of this. And when Socrates expresses some surprise at what Euthyphro is doing, Euthyphro rebukes Socrates, Socrates. Justice must be served, he says, no matter who's involved. And those who say that it's impious for a son to proceed against a father, well, they don't really know what piety is and what piety demands. So it's in this way that we're ushered into the heart of the conversation that's recorded in the Euthyphro, which is devoted again to exploring the question, what is piety? But I think it is important to remember here that this is no sort of idle conversation or speculation. Euthyphro is acting on the basis of his supposed knowledge of piety, just as Melodus, one of the accusers of Socrates, is acting on the basis of his supposed knowledge of piety, of what piety requires. So here we see before our eyes, in the, the action of the dialogue, the close kinship between piety and justice. This is a point that I'll return to. Now, the next part of the dialogue begins with Socrates' suggestion that he, Socrates, should become Euthyphro's student so that he can learn what piety is and then defend himself better at his coming trial. Now, naturally, I suppose we're, we're inclined to take this suggestion as an example of Socrates' irony, and probably rightly so. Though Euthyphro, it should be said, uh, and maybe not surprisingly, Euthyphro thinks it's a perfectly sensible suggestion. Still, we can't dismiss entirely, I think, the thought that Socrates may, in fact, seek to learn something from or maybe about Euthyphro, for the reason that I've already tried to indicate. Socrates has a genuine theoretical interest in the opinions of the sincere believer. But the conversation recorded here, I think, is surely also meant to, to bring about a practical goal, to shake Euthyphro's rather amazing self-confidence in his special knowledge of all things divine. Because it's that knowledge, after all, that prompts him to act against his own family as he is. So I think it's fair to say that if Socrates should prove to be successful in shaking Euthyphro's confidence, his family would probably owe Socrates a debt of gratitude. Now, at this point in the conversation, um, they take up in, in earnest the main task. Socrates wants to know what piety itself is. 
He wants to know, as he says, the idea of piety itself. He wants to know, in other words, the class characteristic of piety that all the pious things or examples or acts would have to share and so properly fall into that class, that one class, piety. Euthyphro's first official answer here to Socrates' question, what is piety, is as follows, quote, I say then that the pious is just what I am doing now, to proceed against whoever does injustice, regarding murders or thefts of sacred things, or is doing wrong in any other such thing, whether he happens to be a father or mother or anyone else at all, and not to proceed against him is impious. Euthyphro proceeds to defend his action by referring to the example, the example of the God who is held to be most just, Zeus. Because Zeus bound up his father, Kronos, who in turn had castrated his father. So in proceeding against his father, Euthyphro is simply imitating what Zeus had done. He's imitating the justice of Zeus. And when Socrates asks him whether he really accepts such accounts about the gods, quote, do you truly hold that these things have happened in this way? Euthyphro says, yes, emphatically, I do. Socrates, it should be noted here, clearly does not accept these official accounts. He always hears them, as he says, with annoyance. And as he says, he knows, quote, nothing about such things. A clear case, I think, of Socratic ignorance amounting to a rejection or a denial. Let's not miss the wood for the trees here. Euthyphro accepts the orthodox accounts of the gods, Zeus, Kronos, and so on. Socrates does not accept them. Socrates rejects. Euthyphro accepts orthodoxy. Socrates is guilty of not believing in the gods in whom the city believes. But this isn't all. As he admits, Euthyphro claims to know additional things about the gods or, or the divine that the many, the people, do not know. So Euthyphro's position is kind of orthodoxy plus, if you will. Hence the ridicule that he's subject to whenever he attempts to utter prophecies in the Athenian assemblies, as he tells us. Now Socrates is dissatisfied with, with Euthyphro's first answer, not only because it relies on accounts of the gods that Socrates finds incredible, but also because it's not, strictly speaking, a definition. It is an, an example rather than a definition of piety. Euthyphro remains undaunted, however. His self-confidence is intact. His second answer is this. What is dear to or, or beloved by the gods is pious. Now, in response, Socrates relies on the very myths of the, myths of the gods he had just rejected. According to those accounts, the gods fight among themselves, and they fight over nothing so much as what is or is not just or noble or good, in short, over moral questions. After all, when Zeus famously bound his father Kronos, that act was held by Zeus to be perfectly just and hence was dear to him, whereas it was obviously held to be unjust and so hated by Kronos. In other words, the official accounts of the gods do not guide us unambiguously in one direction or another. The practical implication of this, I think, is clear. Euthyphro, you shouldn't be so certain that prosecuting your father is the just and hence pious thing to do. According to the very authorities, you yourself take most seriously these stories about the gods. We come now to a, a sort of turning point in the dialogue. Socrates offers Euthyphro a way out of the difficulty that he's just pointed out. All right, he says, let's suppose that, that what is pious is what is loved by all the gods, unanimously. Surely the gods don't disagree about everything. And then Socrates asks a brief question whose significance I think it's easy to overlook. Let me quote it. Shouldn't we consider again, Euthyphro, whether this is nobly said? Or should we let it go and just accept what we ourselves and others say, conceding that something is so, if only someone asserts that it is? Or ought we to consider what the speaker says? In other words, Socrates asks Euthyphro whether we need to know, as a result of our own inquiry and reflection, how these matters stand, or whether we can rest satisfied with 
with a kind of deference to authority. And Euthyphro himself insists that they have to consider what's said and not simply accept it. Even a precisely Euthyphro, then, thinks that knowledge of divine matters is both necessary and possible. One could say faith, mere faith alone, isn't enough. And it's this claim on Euthyphro's part to knowledge, to know these things, that proves to be a kind of opening for the inquiries of Socrates. Now what follows is the most famous, maybe I should say infamous, section of the whole dialogue. And it might well seem that Socrates is just engaging here in sort of verbal gymnastics, a verbal trickery. But I want to try to demonstrate that this is not so, and that there is a serious question, a question of of genuine human significance at stake in this section. Here's how he proceeds. You say, Euthyphro, that the pious is what's loved by the gods. Fine. But is the pious loved by the gods because it's pious? Or is it pious because it's loved by the gods? Euthyphro's answer, for the record, is the former. A given thing is loved by the gods because it's pious. In other words, Euthyphro's prosecuting his father is loved by the gods or is dear to them because it is a pious thing to do. The question at issue here, it seems to me, is this. Is there some standard to which the gods, the gods too, look in approving or disapproving of something? And Euthyphro's answer, in, in effect, is Yes, there is. But what would it mean if Euthyphro had answered Socrates' question in the negative? That is, if he'd said, a given thing is pious because it's loved by the gods. What would that mean? It would mean that anything, some X, would, becomes pious solely by virtue of the fact that the gods love or approve of it. Period. There would then be no discernible standard which the gods look to to approve of or disapprove of something. If we ourselves wish to do the pious thing then, we would simply have to follow the wishes, maybe the whims, of the gods. Now it's worthwhile, I think, to pause here for a minute to consider this choice a bit. To repeat, is something pious because it's loved by the gods, or is it loved by the gods because it's pious? Euthyphro, of course, is certain that his prosecution of his father is pious, and hence approved of by the gods. He thinks there's a standard that both he and the gods can understand clearly, what he calls the pious, such that both he and the gods approve of what he's in the process of doing to his father. But let's take another example, one from a tradition closer to us. In Genesis, we read of the famous account of the binding of Isaac. God has come to Abram, and made a covenant with him, according to which Abram, or Abraham as he's now to be called, will become, quote, the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. Now, Abram is already 99 years old, but true to his word, of course, God sees to it that Sarah gives birth to a child, Isaac. But then, in order to test Abraham, God comes to Abraham and tells him to sacrifice Isaac, his only son, and and therefore the means to fulfill God's own promise. Now, as we know, Abraham obeys God's command without the slightest hesitation. So great is his faith in God. Now, let's connect this story to the argument now on the table in the Euthyphro. It could well seem, to this point, that Abraham holds to the view that what is pious is pious because it's dear to God. If it's dear to God that I kill my only son, then I must comply, for killing Isaac must be pious. Abraham, then, would seem to disagree with Euthyphro, who holds that whatever is dear to the gods is dear to them because it's pious. Euthyphro, but not apparently Abraham, looks to a standard apart from what the gods themselves love or do not love what he calls, again, the pious. Abraham, by contrast, looks only to what is loved by God or approved of by him. For Abraham, that is enough, even if it means killing his beloved only son. But is this true even of Abraham? 
As we know, of course, God stayed Abraham's hand at the last moment. God does not, in fact, require of Abraham that he kill Isaac. And would it not have been hard for us, who now read this account, to worship a God who might well command such an act, an act that seems all but incomprehensible in its cruelty? While we may admire Abraham's amazing obedience to God, his faith in God, isn't it necessary for us that God stay Abraham's hand? If this is so, then like Euthyphro, we hold that what is loved by the gods, or or by God, is loved because it is pious. There is some standard at work in us when we read the story of the binding of Isaac, such that the, the pious thing seems to be not to have killed, to have Isaac killed. Well, let's return now to the Euthyphro. Although Euthyphro has been making some progress in in making clear to, to Socrates what he thinks piety is, there is a pretty obvious problem with his argument. For what is loved by the gods is loved by them because it's pious. This is what I've called the standard apart from the gods' love itself, which elicits that love, you could say. Then Euthyphro still hasn't told us what piety actually is. What is this thing called the pious or piety that elicits the God's love or approval? Well, Euthyphro's eventual answer is, it seems to me, the most important with a view to theoretical or philosophic concerns. Euthyphro argues, with some help from Socrates, that all of piety is a part of the broader category, justice. There's justice in the sense of of what we owe to our fellow human beings, and there's justice in the sense of of what we owe to the gods. So the gods, too, know of and love justice. If a given act is just, then the gods approve of it. And if it in some way concerns them, they'll also deem it to be pious. Here we should recall, I think, Euthyphro's opening statement concerning the prosecution of his father, There he had insisted to Socrates that that the sole consideration was whether or not the accused had acted justly or unjustly, not whether he's related to you and so on. And if that person has acted unjustly, then the pious thing was to prosecute, even for a son to prosecute a father. So in a sense, we've, we've come full circle, back to justice, but in such a way as to see with fresh eyes the centrality of justice, of our moral concerns or opinions, to any conception of piety and its demands. Because Euthyphro is certain that it's just to prosecute his father, he's certain that it's also approved of by the gods, that is, that it's pious. Because we sense that Abraham's killing of the innocent Isaac would be unjust, we sense that piety could not demand it of him, as, of course, God does not demand it of him in the event. Now, in the last section of the dialogue, Socrates tries a few different rhetorical strategies to test Euthyphro, to to test him, that is, to see whether he's willing to sever this connection between justice and piety. These strategies reach their high point, or maybe their low point, when Socrates tries to suggest that, that piety understood as service to the gods, is nothing other than a kind of crass commercial exchange. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I give a vote of offering, you'll answer my request. Needless to say, Euthyphro is not so happy with this line of argument, because it's so crude. Euthyphro resists, then, any attempt to to strip piety of its connection to nobility and to justice. But in the context, this is just another confirmation, I think, of the importance of the link that Euthyphro states between justice and piety. Well, let me now offer a few remarks by way of a kind of summary and conclusion. The Euthyphro presents Plato's most direct account of Socrates inquiring into what is surely the most sensitive and the most potentially explosive question, what is piety? 
For a significant number of Socrates' fellow citizens were of the view that when it came to the gods, there was something not quite right about Socrates. And I think the dialogue the Euthyphro demonstrates, with all the clarity that it's reasonable to wish for, really, that they were correct. Socrates here claims to know, quote, nothing about the orthodox accounts of the orthodox gods, and he hears such tales with, quote, annoyance. And though Euthyphro is, by his own admission, an oddball, yes, he accepts all of the orthodox religious views, but he has some additional ones of his own as well. Nonetheless, I think Socrates' conversation with him is revealing. It's revealing because it shows the, the general approach that Socrates took to the challenge that orthodox piety poses to the philosophic life, to the life of reason. Socrates did not probe, together with Euthyphro, things like the, the idea of nature or the natural necessities and so on, the crucial categories for the philosopher, as we learned from Aristophanes' Clouds. He began instead from Euthyphro's own deepest concerns, the concerns that, that guide his life as a matter of fact, that is, his embrace of piety, and, it turns out, his very great concern for justice. One of the most important parts of the dialogue, it seems to me, is that which explores the idea that there must be some standard we look to, and that we suppose the gods look to, in determining what is and what is not pious. If this is so, then it would be humanly impossible for us to worship a simply mysterious god. One who could, for example, make a covenant on one day only to violate it the next without rhyme or reason. It would be humanly impossible to worship a god whose actions we could not say were just or unjust. After all, to return for a minute to the case of Genesis, it is Abraham who questions God's actions by appealing precisely to God's justice. Quote, Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Genesis 18.25. Surely it is Abraham's certainty that God is just that prompts him to follow uh, God so obediently. And we, for our part, I think, can remain convinced of God's justice by the fact that he stays Abraham's hand at the crucial moment. Now, the very great importance of justice to Euthyphro's piety suggests that a certain human opinion which always at some point will claim to be knowledge, is very much at work in the phenomenon of piety, the opinion or knowledge of what justice is and, and what it demands of us. This connection between justice and piety leaves open the possibility, at least, that a philosopher who, who took the trouble to inquire into the human opinions about justice or morality could well come to a new and maybe better understanding of piety. Here I think we see the deepest theoretical significance of the so-called Socratic turn, or Socratic revolution, as I've called it. The turn that is characteristic of Socrates, away from the, the scientific doctrines of his predecessors, and toward the opinions expressed in ordinary speech. Now we will have occasion, of course, in our remaining lectures, to return to this difficult but provocative thought.